Hi, I'm Seth. Just in case you were sleeping, we no longer are. Well, happy Sabbath. Can you speak now? <laughs> kind of got frozen in fear there for a moment, or shock or something. Yes, thank you for coming today. And uh, we just pray that the Lord will bless you. God is faithful. Amen. The title of my message is All Be One. What is the value of unity? Strength. Strength, yeah. Uh, if you're playing tug of war and you're not in unison, is it going to work too well? No. Are we in a tug of war? Yes. We are in a spiritual warfare on this earth. And how well we work together affects our success. It affects our success as a church, as a local church, in our Wenatchee Valley. And, you know, how, how do we attain that unity? You know, how do we connect in a way to receive that unity? And then what are the blessings when we have that unity? What is the blessing that we can receive? Um, have you ever driven a car that's out of time? Its timing is not lined up like it's supposed to be in the engine. Have you ever had a car like that? I had an old, I call it my Toyota Feet Beaner because it was a 1976 uh, Toyota Corolla. It had the old rotor and you had to gap your points just right and that little the, those little points were two kind of round circles that it's a little clamp that's close together and they spaced just enough to give a spark and that would shoot down the um, uh, uh, the, the cable for going to your spark plug and that thing was rotating at a high speed and it was sending these sparks you know in just the right time and then you had to get a hold of your your, your timing belt and you had to have a light that had that flashing at a certain speed. So not only your points, but your, your belt had to be in time so that everything fired just right to make that thing run smoothly. And it's kind of an art to figure that out. You know, I mean, you, but you had to have a timing light. Do we need a timing light in our life? We do. And I tell you, when that thing was not in time, it did not get very good fuel economy, did not have very good power, and it was old to begin with, so you had all that on top of itself, and it was quite the little machine. But when it was in time, it actually ran pretty good. And so unity, I believe, is kind of a little picture of that, that when unity is how we work together, we get in time and we function as a unified machine, and those engine parts run smoothly, it gives us power to accomplish our mission. And so I want to delve into that, to that concept today a little bit. So let's go to John 17, 20 again, through 20. Two. John 17. Probably should get my regular Bible here and be a little faster than my new modern version here. Proverbs 17, 20, 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So Jesus is praying for his disciples. He's not just praying for them, but who is he praying for? All of us. And now the good news is that some of you are here who maybe aren't baptized into the faith of Jesus Christ. God, pray for you. 
You are here today that you might receive of his word. And he's praying specifically that they may all be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may also be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So what is this verse saying? That when we are one, what's going to happen? When you and I are in unity, it says the world will what? Will believe. Did you catch that? Is the world believing us? If the world is not believing us, why is that? Maybe we need to be more one. It's kind of a challenging thought, isn't it? For the church to have the success it needs, it needs to be one. As God and Jesus are one, He's praying that we will find and understand that unity and that connection, that we will be one to have an influence that the world will believe and want to be a part of. And when we have that connection, that spirit, and I believe that in the Abundant Life Church, I'm not saying this morning we don't have that, but I'm not saying we have that to the fullest even. I believe we can all grow, we can all improve on being more one. And so, Jesus is saying here, when you achieve this oneness, the world will believe. And the glory which thou givest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Is that good news? Amen. Jesus has given us what we need. He has given us the tools. So let's go to Matthew 25. And a lot of us know this story a little bit, but I know there are some here that don't. And, or maybe not fully, but... So Matthew 25, we're going to read verses 1 through 15, kind of uh, refresh here. Because a part of what I believe creates this unity and creates this cohesiveness is our connection to the power that accomplishes that. And it really has to take place on a corporate level. And so here we're reading about the foolish virgins and the wise virgins. There are ten of them. You look at verse 1. And the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. So what's the difference between the five wise and the five foolish? They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil in them. Whereas, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Jesus says we are a light that's set on a hill to shine, right? But you can't shine if you don't have what? Oil. See, back in their day, they had these little vessels, and they filled them with oil, and they lined it on the end, and that was their little, little lamp while they could work in the evening. And so the oil was what burned to provide the light. So what is the oil? The Holy Spirit. And so while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil. For our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. But was it too late? It was. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. 
So sometimes we think that being a Christian is about being generous and sharing, but this is something that we can't share. It's something we each have to gain on our own individual basis in our own relationship. We need oil. And we need enough oil to help carry us through the end time. We're coming upon a time where we need a connection to God like no other. It's a time that we cannot describe nor understand. We have never seen. And we have seen little glimpses in the past few years of how things can change very rapidly. And if we do not have a connection, it's going to be easy to become discouraged. It's going to be easy to walk away because we don't want to face the challenges that are coming. But if we have that spirit and we have that connection, and as a church, together, we have that unity, there will be something the world cannot defy. It will be a power to carry and be a place for bringing in that will be healing and strengthening. But we have to, on an individual basis, be connecting with that spirit, that oil. In John 16, let's go to John 16. Looking at verses 7 through 13. John 16, 7 through 13. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they that believe not on me. And of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. You see, this, this comforter, this Holy Spirit, and if you look down at verse 30, 13, it specifically says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into some truth. All truth. So the Holy Spirit is what gives us truth. If we have not that Spirit to the fullness, to the measure, it's easy to fall into deception. It's easy to fall into misleading concepts and ideas and fanaticism. Satan is working hard within the church. And actually one of those is about this very topic about the Holy Spirit and its role, its position in the Godhead. And there's a couple of quotes later on I'm going to share with you about this because this is the greatest gift God has given to His church. That's why Satan is attacking it drastically, especially in this time, because if he can get people disconnected from the very power Christ sent to enable us to get victory, you lose the battle. This is the power. This is what gives the victory to overcome ourselves. And that's why when you're reading the ten virgins, it's a picture of each individual virgin. It's not corporate. It's not something that I can buy or sell from each other. It's something that has to come from our own individual relationship. It's our own experience. David, when he went into battle, to fight Goliath, did not use Saul's armor. He didn't train in it. He didn't experience it. He didn't study it. And that's an illustration of spiritually, when you and I come to fight our spiritual battles, I can't use the tools of my wife even. I can't use the tools of Dr. Mayer's experience. I have to use my own relationship with Jesus to gain the victory. David knew how to use the sling. He knew how he, he practiced. He was out there every day in the fields, zinging his stones, knocking it into the tree holes. He was knocking rocks off the top of other rocks. He was practiced. 
And so in our spiritual battles, in our spiritual journey, are you using the Holy Spirit in your own experience? Gaining that connection, knowing how that voice speaks to you, how it turns you to the right or to the left on a day-to-day -day basis. Because when the battle comes, that's what will give you the victory. That's what will give you the strength to stand, is that personal connection with the Spirit. And as I am studying every day and surrendering to His Word, that's what teaches me about my sin. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss the sins that I need to reform if I'm not in that Word every day. I'm going to miss about how to replace that sin with righteousness of Christ's life and His, His being and who He is. And I'm going to miss understanding the judgment, that there is a judgment taking place and I need to be ready for that judgment. That I need to know how I get the victory in that judgment if I'm not personally connected. But when the Spirit of Truth has come, the promise is, He will guide you into all truth. Amen. That is a promise we can cling to and claim. He will fulfill that for each one of us individually. And then as we come together as individuals, if we're connected to the Spirit individually, how is He going to connect to the Spirit as a whole? going to be spirit-filled. Okay. Amen? Okay. There's a quote here I want to share from um, Allied's writings. I believe it's from uh, I had it written down here. I must have bumped it off here. But When he, the spirit of truth, is come, said Jesus, he will guide you into all truth. The comforter is called the spirit of truth. His work is to define and maintain the truth. He first dwells in the heart as the spirit of truth, and thus he becomes the comforter. There is comfort and peace in truth. But no real peace or comfort can be found in falsehood. It's by being in the scriptures that speak to the mind and impress truth upon the heart. Thus he exposes error and expels it from the soul. It is by the Spirit of Truth working through the Word of God that Christ subdues His chosen people to Himself. What subdues us? To God to be one? It's His Spirit and His Word. It's the highest of all gifts. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given His Spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil, to impress His own character upon His church. That's a powerful statement. All hereditary and all cultivated. You know, many people in the arguments of today will be alcoholism. You know, it's in my family line. It's, it's a hereditary tendency, right? Inclinations for unnatural love in same-sex marriages. That's hereditary. That's just who I am. That's part of my DNA. Who created us? Who? You were studying in Sabbath school that about talking about the DNA and how when we hear things in God's Word that that resonates with our being, right? But can God change our desires? Change our hereditary tendencies and cultivated tendencies for evil? Yeah. Amen. He can give us a new heart, a new mind, new desires to impress His own character upon His church. Let's go to Ephesians 4. This is one of my favorite texts in Scripture. Because here we have the body of the church. And if 
Ephesians 4, 11 through 13. Actually, I'll jump up to verse 2. So with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. So let's go back and look at that. What does it take to have that unity in the church? Loneliness. Meekness. Long suffering. Forbearing one another in love. Is the unity described in by the Spirit in Scripture. So I want you to reflect upon your own character a little bit. When you read some of those things, did something pop out to you that maybe I need to be a little more long-suffering? You know, maybe, maybe I need to be a little more lowly in my estimation of myself in the church. Maybe I need a little more meekness. Because these are the things that help bring unity through the Spirit's leading in the church to help us achieve what Christ is wanting to do through us. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. This is what the world will see and it will convict them. Amen? Amen. That gives us the power. That's what gives us the ability to accomplish our work on this earth. But on verse 13 it says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We want to be full? Amen. We want the fullness of Christ in our church. This unity, these character traits, help us fulfill the fullness of Christ. And it's, you know, there's other texts in the Bible that talk about how we're one body, but many members. And the beauty is, it's not that we're all working as a machine that does exactly the same ministry or exactly the same thoughts or exactly the same ideas. It's we have a right hand and we have a left hand and we have... We have a head, and we have a feet, and we have the knees, and we have hips, and we have many parts to this body, but they all work together to accomplish the ministry goal. And that's what I like about the beauty of the atmosphere of the Advent of the Abundant Life Church is where we're learning to work together, where we've got many ministries going on in this direction, we've got ministries going on in this direction, and we've got people serving in this position, people serving in that position. But it's not one greater than the other. It's not one more lowly than the other. It's we are one. And we're learning to work together to be one. To serve as a team. That's what gives us the strength. The preaching of the Word will be of no avail without the continual presence and the aid of the Holy Spirit. This is the only effectual teacher of divine truth. The only. We need that Spirit to have the power. When we're coming to our Bible studies, when we're coming to our children's programs, when we're coming to evangelistic series, What's going to give us the victory? The Holy Spirit. Only when 
truth is accompanied to the heart by the Spirit, will it quicken the conscience or transform the life? One might be able to present the letter of the Word of God who might be familiar with all its commands and promises, but unless the Holy Spirit sets home the truth, no souls will fall on the rock and be broken. No amount of education, no advantages, however great, can make one a channel of light without the cooperation of the Spirit of God. So here's the challenge. Can we be busy and fail? Can we be doing wonderful things and wonderful ministries yet have no effect? The scary thing is, is yes. From the outside we can look very successful yet not be successful. And so that's why we as a church, as a corporate team, as a whole together, need to seek God individually to make sure we're connecting with the Spirit. Praying for that Spirit. Having it come into our heart and our mind to teach us as we study the Word so that we are individually being refined. Letting sin be shown to us. Letting righteousness be taught to us. Letting us understand the present judgment of where we are in life's history. So that we can come together as a team through the Holy Spirit to work for His people. And when we do, Philippians 2.13 says, it will be to will and to do of His good pleasure. Sometimes, we have great ideas as humans, don't we? But is it His book? I mean, is it God's leading our will? I'm not saying we aren't doing that in the front of that church. I'm just saying, asking the question, are we? We gotta make sure we're staying surrendered to that on a day-to-day -day basis. And if God is leading, if God is directing, it will be for His good pleasure. Only those who humbly wait upon God and watch for His guidance and grace in the Spirit, the power of God awaits their demand and reception. This promised blessing claimed by faith brings all other blessings in His train. It is given according to the riches of the grace of Christ. And He is ready to supply every soul according to the capacity to receive. God will bless if we have His Spirit in us and working through us. In Acts chapter 2 we read of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to look at that text a little bit here in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 3. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were all in one accord in one place. This is what I love about our prayer ministry right now in the Abundant Life Church. How in the past few months our church has really been promoting prayer and getting us deeper connected in prayer from conference level to personal church level. So they were all together on the cord in one place and they were praying and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And they appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with what? The Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. When we humble ourselves, when we come together and connect in prayer, corporate, asking and seeking, what does the Scripture show us that will happen? The Spirit will come. When we are surrendered of self, when we are letting go of our animosities or what we expect of other people to perform or do or and we're meek we're lowly we're surrendered then the spirit will come and thousands in one day were brought to the church I believe God has mighty things planned for us church 
But we all must come to the place where we are truly surrendered, truly humbled of self and willing. And I need to be there just as much as anybody else. Amen? <laughs> we are all in need of coming before the Lord. Have you ever heard of the 1888 message given to the Adventist Church? Back long ago, and anybody have an idea what that message was about? Righteousness by faith. Christ's righteousness imputed to us that we could live out His character. Do you know the brethren back in those days were not very lonely? You could have one brother stand up front, and he could preach a sermon, and then there would start a debate. And another brother would come up front and he would preach his sermon for another hour or two to redirect the congregation and to set straight the principles that were incorrectly presented in the previous hour. And there were many debates in the old church. But all Mike says directly that this message of 1888 is a most precious message through his servants, Elders Wagner and Jones. Why? Because it drew attention to the character of Christ. It drew attention to the spirit of Christ's nature to help them come to the full measure, to the full stature of Christ. Truth is just a portion. How we present the truth is the fulfillment of the portion. We need the balanced perspective of truth, yet the love and grace of Christ, His character, His meekness, His lowliness, His love, you know, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Against these, there is no, no law. It's a message that promotes the third angel's message. Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. What does the Holy Spirit come to teach? About judgment, right? About His character. It is not the opposition of the world that endangers us the most. It is the evil cherished in the hearts of professed believers that works our most grievous disaster and most retards the progress of God's cause. There is no sure way of weakening our spirituality than by being envious, suspicious of one another, full of fault-finding and evil surmising. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envy, envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, and gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits. This is James chapter 3, if you want to look at it. James chapter 3, verses 15 through 18. Full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace, of that that make peace. Councils to the church, harmony and union existing among men of very dispositions is the strongest witness that can be born that God has sent His Son into the world to save sinners. Amen? Amen. Harmony and union is the strongest witness. We are coming and working together, doing cooking classes, some having different parts, some helping out with tea, some helping out with Bible studies, some helping out with... Are we working in harmony and in union to accomplish the goal? We have an opportunity to pray together. 
before these evangelistic series, series comes. I just want to encourage our church family to go and spend that private time. Connect with Christ. Be willing to look into your own heart. How do I view my brethren? What are my thoughts that I have? But sometimes we can present good out-front presentations, but in our heart we're wrestling. We're wrestling with how we feel about those in our church. Because sometimes, you know, the board doesn't get it right. We're human. Sometimes people aren't doing their duties like they're supposed to. How do we let that affect us? Sometimes, you know, what was taught in the Bible study wasn't how I view it. How does that make me feel? But the strongest witness that can be born is harmony and union. Not just presentation, but in the depth of our heart. How are we unified in the view of our church body? If our people will act upon the light that is given, this is from Councils of the Church as well, page 66, we shall surely see of the salvation of God. Wonderful revivals will follow. Sinners will be converted and many souls will be added to the church. When we bring our hearts into unity with Christ and our lives into harmony with His work, the Spirit that fell on the disciples on the day of Pentecost will fall on us. Amen? That is a promise. Notice that it is after the disciples had come into perfect unity that this is when the Spirit was given to them to accomplish the ministry for Christ's sake. In Acts 4.32, go to chapter 4, Verse 32. And it says, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said they any of them that ought of the things which he had possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. The more we come into unity, the more we surrender self. The more we surrender, this is my own spiritual battle. No, I want to have my house. I want to have my ministry. I want to have my ideas, right? But am I willing to surrender to the corporate leading of God's Spirit upon His church? Am I willing to come into true unity with the Spirit of one another? The disciples did not ask for blessings. This is from, again, Councils of the Church, page 98. The disciples did not ask for blessings for themselves, but they were waiting with the burden of souls. And that's what I'd love to hear in some of our elder discussions. I only came in at the end, sadly. But the discussion was about the burden for souls. And I believe that's the root of the Abundant Life Church. We want souls to know the gospel truth. And you saw June's heart here this morning. We love for souls to hear the truth. The gospel was to be carried to the ends of the earth and they claimed the endowment of power that Christ had promised. Then it was the Holy Spirit was poured out and thousands were converted in a day. Let Christians put away all dissension and give themselves to God for the saving of the lost. Then let them ask in faith for the promised blessing and it will come. Amen? It will come. Is that good news? Amen. Amen. The outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the apostles was the former reign. 
and the glorious was the result, but the latter rain will be more abundant. Is that exciting? We can have a more abundant growth in the church. What is the promise to those living in these last days? Turn you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. This is from Zechariah chapter 9 and 10. Turn you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. Ask ye of the Lord, rain in the time of the latter rain, so that the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them the showers of rain to everyone grass in the field. Amen. Dear friends, I believe we are on the precipice of amazing things. We have some amazing developments taking place in our church, more than we've seen in the past. And I believe the more we can come together and let that spirit stay connected, the more we can make sure Satan has no avenue to stop the movement of God's spirit. That we can keep victory taking place in our church. As children of God are one in Christ, how does Jesus look upon caste, upon society distinctions, upon the division of man from his fellow man because of color, race, position, wealth, birth, or attainments? The secret of unity is found in the equality of believers in Christ. Chapter, I mean, tells us the church, 289. Unity has nothing to do with caste. Has nothing to do with education. Has nothing to do with wealth. We come together, we put it all on the table, and we work together. Then we can experience the blessing of Christ's unity. Strive earnestly for unity. Pray for it. Work for it. It will bring spiritual health. Elevation of thought, nobility of character, heavenly mindness enabling you to overcome selfishness and evil surmisings to be more than conquerors through him that loved you and gave himself for you. Crucify self, esteem others better than yourselves. Thus shall be brought into oneness with Christ. When we have oneness with Christ, we will have his unity. And we will have his spirit. And that is invincible. That is victory. Amen? Amen. So now that I just have a little time at the end of the service, we spend a couple of minutes just praying together for that unity. That Christ will help us to truly achieve his desire for us. And then I will close with prayer. So just you can gather in small groups. Just pray together corporately. And then I'll come up and I will close.